Joan Collins is president of Adirondack Avian Expeditions and Workshops, and she leads birding trips year round. She's a New York State licensed guide. She's an Adirondack 46er, for those of you that know what that is, and has climbed all of the Adirondack Fire Tower peaks as well. She's past president of the New York State Ornithological Association, and this is a group you really should know about, nybirds.org, nybirds.org. That's sort of like a federation of all the different bird clubs and Audubon groups in the state. In fact, that was its old name. But the Ornithological Association keeps track of the statewide records, uh, produces a checklist, and is a great way to connect with birders across New York State, uh, nybirds.org. Joan Collins is currently the editor of New York Birders, which is a publication from NISOA, the New York State Ornithological Association. And she's past board of directors member of the Audubon Council of New York State, another good group. And past president, current board member of her own chapter, which is New York Audubon Society. You may have seen, uh, Joan has published a number of different articles, journals, magazines, newspapers, both in Audubon, New York Birders, in uh, Conservationists, the New York DEC magazine, Adirondack Life magazine, and others. Um, she's authored several warbler species accounts in addition to serving as a peer reviewer on that second atlas of breeding birds of New York. And now, 10 years later, we're in our third atlas, breeding bird atlas, and uh, all that data is telling us a story, part of the story Joan is going to tell tonight. So she's a, uh, Joan is a frequent keynote speaker and workshop leader. So we're really delighted to have some time to spend with her tonight here on Zoom. Some of you met her, uh, heard her talk already in bird chat a couple months ago. Um, and so the stories that she can tell us because of her knowledge over the decades of the Adirondacks uh, is really extraordinary. And she always has great images and video and sound to help us enter into her world in the North Country of birds and changing habitats. So I'm really looking forward to this. And uh, Joan, I'm going to turn it over to you now. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I, I originally gave this presentation um, several years ago for the Linnaean Society um, in New York. They actually asked me in, for this particular topic. So I, I, I kind of pulled all this information together. And um, if, I don't. It's, it's about Adirondack birding, but it's a lot about climate change. So it's kind of a, a, a collection of scientific information and just some of my observations of what's been happening up here over the last few decades. Um, so it, this is called Current and Projected Effects of Climate Change on Boreal Habitats and Birds of the Adirondacks. Um, and I've kind of modified this presentation. I've given this presentation a lot. A lot of people um, have been asking for this presentation. Um, this is information that people seem to really want to know. What's, what's happening with climate change and how is it uh, affecting the, uh, the habitat and the birds up here and other animals. And so that's what this presentation will be about tonight. And if you have questions, uh, you can put them in, I guess, the chat and we'll do that later. And I'll stay for as long as people want after. Um, sometimes when I do presentations for the Wild Center, we go another hour, <laughs> just questions. So I'm willing to hang out um, if you guys are willing to hang out too and answer questions. So I'll go through this. There's a little bit of overlap between what I did in November and this presentation, not a lot, but a little bit. So um, some of the slides might look familiar, um, but if you're, if you're new, this will kind of give you a, a, a basis for getting started. So we'll talk a little bit about boreal habitat and what that is. And then we'll also talk about the world population and atmospheric CO2 and climate change in the Adirondacks. And then we'll talk about specific species, the current and future status of the boreal species. Um, not all of them, because there's a lot of them, um, but I picked out uh, quite a few that we'll, we'll just kind of touch on briefly to let you know what's happening with them. So that's um, boreal forest there, and you can see the, the mossy ground cover. Next one. So the word boreal means northern, and it comes from uh, Boreas, god of the north wind in Greek mythology. So it refers to northern places. And we're very lucky in the Adirondacks. We're, um, you know, we're, we're not as far north as the Canadian boreal, but we've got this little circle over the Adirondacks with little circles within it of boreal habitat. And the main plant life in boreal habitat is mostly coniferous. So you have tamaracks, spruces, pines, and balsam fir, and, and mossy ground, that's usually a component. And also some broadleaf trees like birches and aspens um, occur in this habitat. So, whoops, too fast on my mouse, there we go. Um, so where, where is this habitat? It's up on the very high mountain summits. 
It's in bogs and fens that are lower down in the Adirondacks, um, also in lower elevation spruce fir forests, beaver meadows, marshes and swamps, and along some of the lakes and rivers. Okay, there's White Face Mountain, which is the fifth highest peak in the Adirondacks, and this is a mountain you can actually drive up. So you can actually, it's the only way to drive up into Bicknell's thrush habitat, so it's a kind of a popular mountain for birders. Um, but it has boreal habitat at the top, um, pretty much covered by balsam fir trees. With just a few uh, red spruce and uh, mountain ash trees, mossy ground cover. This is Massawipi Mire, which is the largest bog in the Adirondacks. And what we call bogs in the Adirondacks are actually all fens. They're not quite as acidic as the Canadian bogs. Uh, a true bog only has rainwater as its source of uh, moisture. In, in the Adirondacks, we have brooks and rivers running through pretty much every bog that, that we have. So they're a little bit less acidic than the, than the Canadian bogs. And you can see, um, by the way, all of the tamarack trees there, they're kind of a cold tolerant species. This is also Massawipi Mire. This is a wide open area on the Boy Scout side. Uh, they put a, a, a boardwalk out there. This is the dangerous part of the bog. Um, I always tell people, if you see sections of bog like this with no trees, you don't want to walk into it, which is why people put boardwalks. I did see um, a young man walk off the boardwalk at Kurt's Bog. I was leading an, an Audubon trip many, many years ago. And I was telling everyone to stay on the boardwalk and out ahead of us was a man with a teenage boy and he walked off and went right up to his neck in bog muck. So you push through, it's a, it's a floating mat, um, this uh, sphagnum moss, it's kind of a floating, a floating bog mat over what looks like kind of like uh, muddy quicksand. <laughs> and it's really hard to get out of. So you've probably heard of people getting bogged down. Um, you've probably heard of 10,000 year old bodies being found in bogs over in Europe because there's no oxygen under there. So things get preserved. So bogs are very dangerous places. This would be a very dangerous place to walk out because if you punch through there, there's nothing to pull out on. Uh, you, would, you wouldn't have a bush or a tree to, to grab hold of to pull yourself out. And it is like kind of quicksand stuff. So uh, bogs are, are dangerous, just, just a note. Um, this is a uh, different bog. This is the second largest bog in the Adirondacks. This is Spring Pond Bog and it's a Nature Conservancy property in Tupper Lake. Really beautiful spot. Uh, this is a pitcher plant, so there's kind of unique plants that are in the bogs, and, and this plant eats insects. Um, it has a pitcher with water in it, and the insects go down in there and end up in the water and are, are consumed by this plant, um, which is because there aren't a lot of nutrients in the bog, that, and the plants get their nutrients from the insects, some of the insect-eating plants. And here is boreal forest. Uh, again, you see coniferous trees with very mossy ground. Boreal habitats are very wet. Um, very wet places. This is a boardwalk through uh, a very wet area along the Mountaineer Trail, which is at Massawipi. It's a beautiful, it's probably my favorite trail in the Adirondacks. I love this trail. It goes around Massawipi Lake and it's just a spectacular trail. Very well maintained by the Boy Scouts and lots and lots of boardwalks and wooden walkways because it's a very wet area. And you can see there's some Labrador tea down See my mouse here. Down in the right, there's a Labrador tea there. So you see a lot of the bog plants and orchids and things, unusual plants in, in boggy areas. This is Mud Pond in Long Lake, which is now open for canoeing. And you can find bog plants all along this and, and boreal birds, it's a lovely spot. OK, so that was sort of a quick run through of boreal habitat. <laughs> if you have any questions on boreal habitat, I kind of went through that quickly because we, we did talk about that in November. So um, if you participate then you probably remember some of those things. So now I'm going to jump to the second subject um, just briefly with world population and atmospheric CO2. I don't like to do any talk on climate change without showing this graph. It's pretty alarming. <laughs> For anybody with a biology background I'm sure you're very alarmed because you know what happens to species that do this that overpopulate very, very rapidly. We're coming up on 8 billion people uh, 2023. In two years we're going to hit 8 billion. There were 3 billion people on the planet when I was born. And if I live to my life expectancy, we're going to be at 9 billion, which is a tripling of the world population in one lifetime, which is a major problem. Um, somebody was just commenting about this the other day that, you know, when I was growing up, everyone talked about population, world population. It was a major subject. And no one seems to talk about it much anymore. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but because it's really a problem, as you can see. So there was a little tick up. If you see the two to five million year section with the little dotted line, and you see kind of a tick up tiny tick up in the population, that was um, agriculture. So as soon as humans learned how to plant seeds of plants and they could live in one place, 
Um, so agriculture was a huge turning point and, and that ticked up the population at that point. And then we had the major tick up with the Industrial Revolution, as you can see <laughs> at the other end of the graph. Um, and we just keep going up and up and up um, very quickly. So atmospheric CO2 has been measured from 1958 um, to current, and that's being done at the Mauna, uh, Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And this is called the Keeling Curve after Charles Keeling, who was the one who started doing this. So they've been monitoring the amount of carbon in the atmosphere um, since 1958, and you can see what's happening. And we're actually over 410 now parts per million um, in the atmosphere. And you probably heard a lot about 350.org. Um, for many, many years, they were saying there's no way that humans could live if we went over 350 parts per million. Well, we're way over. Um, we're 60 over now. So, and I've got some more graphs coming up on this. Um, this is atmospheric CO2 over the past 10,000 years. And you can see that our species pretty much um, evolved on a planet that was between 260 and 280 parts per million um, for CO2 levels in our atmosphere. And now if you take a look down at the, the far end there around 2000, you can see what's happening. We're just shooting that number straight up. Um, and this is unprecedented. Even in, in times in our, in our past when, when the levels of CO2 have gone up and down, it's never ever been this rapid. So this is sort of an unknown for humans to figure out what's going to happen next. And this is um, a truly frightening graph. And I've heard that this graph is actually at the Smithsonian um, taking up an entire wall because it is really a frightening graph. Um, so if you take a look at the last 800,000 years, you can see that the temperature of the Earth is completely dependent on the parts per million um, of, of the atmospheric CO2 levels, basically. So when the atmospheric CO2 goes up, the temperature of the Earth goes up. When the atmospheric CO2 goes down, the temperature of the Earth goes down, and it, and it just stays right in line. And we know this from ice core samples. And then you go down to the uh, right-hand side of this graph from 1880 to 2020, and you can see that we're just shooting the CO2 levels up. Um, it's just an incredibly rapid pace. And so what's happening is there's um, the changes in the ocean surface and the um, the ice, uh, the ice sheets. So those two things are going to make the temperature of the Earth rise, and it will rise because that red line that you see over there, that's only at 300, is going to go up and 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 be in line with that blue line, um, which means that we have committed the Earth right now to four degrees Celsius more. And the only reason that you're not seeing that temperature right now is because it's going to take the Earth a while to catch up, but it will. And what the unknown is, is when that's going to happen. Some people think it'll happen within 100 years. Some people think it might be a little bit longer that it takes the ocean and the ice sheets a while to kind of be back in sync with the CO2. So it is going to happen. And I think, you know, the first time I saw this graph, it was, I found it truly frightening because we've, we've warmed up one degree Celsius, but we've committed ourselves to four more. And you can already see what's happening to the world with a one degree Celsius warm up. So it's a, it's a pretty frightening graph. Um, to look at, I think. So uh, that was a, kind of a quick um, status of, of the CO2 in the atmosphere and, and, and our overpopulation. And now I'm just going to talk about climate change in the Adirondacks. And here, this is a, a, a photograph from Long Lake. This was uh, plowing in the old days before cars. So they used to use horses and a big roller to squish the snow down. Um, this is a picture from the 1920s, and you can see the massive amounts of snow with buildings completely covered. This is actually a neighbor's house of ours down the road. Um, and this is Long Lake in 1928 with the first one of the first plows. And then we jumped to the 1990s when we moved to the Adirondacks in the mid 1990s. Um, the winters were, <laughs> I have to say, overwhelming. Um, I came from the Albany area. I grew up, um, I, I started out on Long Island and we moved upstate when I was six. And our, our winters were sort of moderate in the Albany area. And then when we moved to the Adirondacks, the snow would come um, at the beginning of October and that would melt, but by the end of October, the ground was covered and you didn't see the ground again until late April. It was six months. I mean, snowmobiles were just, you know, it was unbelievable. I mean, there were snowmobiles everywhere. Um, this is what our front lawn looked like. My son Ford, I think he was seven or eight in this picture. I mean, this just massive amounts of snow. That you can barely see our car. This is, uh, the boys had to wear snowshoes. I actually, when I first put this presentation together for the Linnaean Society, I actually cried because I had sort of forgotten. It's so funny how fast you can forget what things used to be like because the boys could not, my two sons could not go outside the house without snowshoes on. 
I mean, they would have disappeared. <laughs> so they were they they just learned to put snowshoes on, like you would put boots on. They they would just wear, wear snowshoes, and we lived in snowshoes. Um, this is our driveway. The driveway was always a tunnel. Um, this is a sign that's really high. This is the sign junction between Cascade and Porter, which are two high peaks. And a lot of the signs disappear sometimes <laughs> when you get enough snow, but they're really high. I mean, this this sign is is a very tall sign um, and it's, it's almost disappeared there. So those are just some of the, the quick photos of what things used to look like. Um, and now what's, we'll talk about some of the changes that have occurred. Um, the first frost is weeks later. The first frost used to be in September. Now it's, it's definitely October, sometimes even later than that. And the first snow is weeks later. Um, we don't really get snow cover pretty much now until January. I know because Lots of the good birding areas don't get plowed. So I have all that knowledge in my head of when I can get into those places like Madawaska and Masawipi. And so um, we had field trips and we had, we had a number of trips to Masawipi in November. That would have been unheard of years ago because you would never have been able to get in there because it's not plowed. But now we don't really have snow on the ground really until January. Um, the ice on is later by weeks. Um, sometimes months now. So we don't sometimes get the, the lakes frozen until January, where it used to be October. People would get their boats out in September years ago. And now you can just leave your boat in for a really long time. Lake Champlain rarely freezes over now. Um, uh, it used to freeze over every year. And the, the years where it was open were the rare ones. Now it's the other way around. And the ice off is earlier by weeks. And the loons have backed up their nesting a month. Uh, wood ducks have backed up their nesting over a month. So the waterfowl have really responded to that, the fact that the, the lakes are ice free earlier. Um, we don't have any more weeks of the 30 to 40 below temps. I saw my lowest was 37 below. Uh, and my husband saw 48 below in his time in the Adirondack. So the, you know, historically, you would have these intensely cold weeks. And during those intensely cold weeks, the invasive species, the beetles and things would be killed. They couldn't live through that. So we don't have that anymore. Um, I would say in the past decade, the coldest I've seen was minus 22. And that was a real rare, rare event <laughs> to see that kind of temperature again. Uh, we just, you know, very rarely go below zero anymore. I would say it just doesn't really happen. Um, and we have many more severe weather events. And I'm going to show you some photos of some of those. And the Long Lake winter events um, are only planned for February now. So the Parks and Recreation Department doesn't plan any winter events outside of February because there's nothing reliable. And even February hasn't been very reliable actually either. Um, the snowmobile season in 2018 was only three weeks long and that was really remarkable. And I can't recall the last time I put snowshoes on. I honestly don't remember when I wore snowshoes last. Um, wildlife changes. Snow fleas used to be the sign of spring, and now you see them all winter long. So snow fleas usually don't see until it's 32 degrees or more, and they and they show up on the snow and they look like jumping fleas. They're not fleas; they're an ancient critter called the springtail. But they, people call them snow fleas because they look like little pieces of pepper and they jump, <laughs> they hop, so they look like fleas. Um, they're very harmless. And in 2018, the eastern chipmunk came out of hibernation to an incredible warm up. I think it, I think it hit into the 80s one February. And all the chipmunks came out of hibernation and the researcher for chipmunks said that they, he thought that they would, many of them would die because you can't go back into hibernation real fast. Um, and this year, strangely enough, my husband told me in January on a very cold day that he saw our chipmunk. We have a, a chipmunk. It's been in our house a number of times. It comes in when you open the door, it's very friendly. Um, and this chipmunk, he said he saw the chipmunk. And I said, no, you probably saw a red squirrel. The chipmunk's hibernating. He said, no, I saw it. I definitely saw a chipmunk. And a couple of days later, he said, look, it's out there again. And out there in two feet of snow was the chipmunk <laughs> eating some corn. And I've seen it out there in single digits and teens uh, this year. It, it doesn't appear to be hibernating. And that's a first. So that's a first for this winter. Um, and ermines and snowshoe hares turn white on a schedule still. But that's the problem for them. So now you, you'll see something that looks like a plastic bag. And it's a snowshoe hare. So they, don't, they can't, they have nothing to blend into anymore, <laughs> which is uh, sad for them. Um, and during a recent warm winter, black bear tracks were observed all winter long. And the researchers at the Huntington facility, the SUNY ESF hunting facility in Newcomb, were saying that they wondered what on earth they were eating and whether they were grumpy. <laughs> Nobody wanted to encounter one. Um, blue jays over, have overwintered for the past five years. And I put in there also um, the wild turkeys have increased in number um, dramatically since, the, since we have so much less snow. 
Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why that's a problem with blue jays overwintering now. And the American crows have been overwintering now for the past four years. The insect populations have plummeted. That's very dramatic. And somebody was asking me about black flies at the beginning before we got started. And black flies, I don't even use spray anymore. It doesn't, you don't really need it. Um, and you couldn't live without it back in the 90s. You would leave your house and run to your car and you'd be covered with hundreds of them. And you'd be bleeding and, you know, and burning was really tough back in the 90s. You know, you'd put your binoculars up and they would be crawling under the eye lens caps. And uh, if you wanted to look at a bird, you just had to deal with being bitten, but not anymore. Um, so it's, it's just really, they're not bad at all. And insect populations are, they have just, it's, it's been an unbelievable decline. You know, in the 90s, we would leave our outside light on on the porch, and if you open the door, everybody would scream because hundreds of insects would flow in. And now you're lucky if you see one or two moths out there, and you don't have insects all over your windshield when you drive anymore. Um, so, and the Vermont study, I don't know if all of you saw that Vermont study that they did 25 years um, studying birds, and they found that the aerial insectivores like swallows and flycatchers have really plummeted because of the lack of flying insects that are out there now. Um, Bald eagles and belted kingfishers are observed all winter. Uh, I, I happened to be on a, a CBC. I was a new birder and I was out with an expert and we were doing the Elizabeth Town Christmas Town and I heard a kingfisher. And so <clears throat> I didn't know if that would be unusual. So I, I said, I hear a kingfisher. And, and the man that I was with said, no, no, no. The, the kingfishers aren't here in the winter. And I said, well, I hear a kingfisher. <laughs> and so he couldn't really hear very well. They had really great eyes. And he said, well, take me to what you're hearing. So I did and it was a kingfisher. Um, and that was the beginning. And from that year on, there were kingfishers tallied in every Christmas bird count. I think every Christmas bird count up here, people find kingfishers. So um, lots of open water um, and bald eagles have open water. So, and they've got, you know, roadkill and things to eat too. So big changes. Back in the 90s, you, you wouldn't see a bald eagle in winter up here. They would be down in the Southern Hudson River. So these are, these are changes that have happened pretty rapidly. Um, the most important bullet on this slide is the last one, the lack of a submitting layer negatively affecting small mammals. And that is a huge, huge change. This is being heavily studied in the Arctic, and I wish it was being heavily studied in the Adirondacks because I know it's having a huge effect. Um, up in the Arctic, they've done studies of what's happening to the wildlife as a, re as a result of that lack of a submitting layer, which is the, the, the space between the snowpack and the ground. And that's where small mammals like voles and lemmings up in the Arctic and um, mice need to live because they don't, they don't hibernate and they need that protection from, it, it's kind of a, a stabilizing temperature that, that is between the snowpack and the ground. And we don't really have that anymore because we keep having, um, this, this winter is a little more traditional where we have more of a snowpack that's been pretty consistent, but we've been having lots and lots of rain. And so what happens is there isn't really that protective submitting layer anymore. The caribou um, numbers in the Arctic have gone from 5 million to 2 million, and they won't even allow hunting with those animals anymore because they can't paw through anymore because they're hitting ice. They can't paw through to the plants that are in that submitting layer to eat. So lots and lots of effects from that. And the, the lemming cycle has been disrupted. The small mammal cycle has definitely been disrupted in, in the other, disrupted in the other projects by this. We used to have cycles of lots of mice coming in our house one year and the next year it would be down and then it would be up again. And that cycle is just out the window. Um, and lots and lots of barred owls are, um, um, uh, starving to death basically because they won't leave their they won't leave their their areas um, they won't leave their territory so they they come to feeder areas they go out to the edge of roadways they get hit by cars um, one got hit on my son's road up here in the Adirondacks um, so that that happens a lot so they're having really rough winters as a as a, as a result of very few small mammals <clears throat> last year we had a lot of cones so um, last the winter before this one. So the owls had a really good nesting year last year. So the northern sawwood owls and belted uh, barred owls and the northern sawwood owls had lots of young. Um, so it was a really good year for them, but they've had mostly bad years. So anyway, the subnivian layers are really important thing to consider. So here's some photos. Um, here is the Adirondack Hotel in April, on April 28, 2011, when we had major, major flooding in the Adirondacks. All three roads into Long Lake were underwater. There was no way for the ambulances to take anyone out if they had a problem. There was no way in or out. Um, we were trapped and people's uh, camps all along the lake were flooded, uh, major, major damage from this. I don't know if you're all familiar with the Adirondack Hotel, but right to the right of it is, um, and, and you wouldn't normally see water up to the steps of the Adirondack Hotel. And to the right is the bridge over Long Lake, which was also underwater. 
Another extreme event hit uh, Memorial Day, May 27th in 2013, when we got a sudden two foot snowfall. This is the road up White Face Mountain. And as you all know, every species was back by then. So you had warblers <laughs> up on the mountain, Bicknell's thrush, everything was back. Um, flycatchers, swallows, and, and then something like this happens and this can do an incredible amount of damage to the wildlife to have these extreme events happening all the time, as we're seeing in Texas at the moment also. Um, this is a black bear with mange, which is something that I've been seeing um, pretty frequently now for the past few years. Um, I mentioned this to the science writer for the Adirondack Explorer, and he started researching and found that Cornell has been studying this um, down in Pennsylvania. The, the state down there actually has a whole plan for dealing with this. If a bear is more than 50% manged, um, they euthanize it. If it's less than 50%, they treat them. Um, so I think this is just a result of the hibernation being disrupted, the winters being disrupted, they're warmer, because um, I had never seen bears with mange before and just, and just until the last few years. Uh, then we're seeing lots of strange timing of births uh, for in bears and in deer. These were three tiny little triplet cubs um, that, this was the end of the summer, um, and cubs, they're, they're usually in May, three times bigger than this. So this bear obviously had these, um, these young much later than normal. Um, and, and the researchers at Huntington have told me that animals often will just try different strategies. This is a, a baby deer and this was fall. Um, so that was another strange thing that I photographed. So the timing of everything seems to be getting a little bit scrambled here. Um, this is an ermine and I just kind of point this out why it's important for the ermine to have snow because otherwise you really, you can barely see it. Um, my son took this photo in our backyard. And so that's a, an animal that, that blends in and it turns brown in the summer. And here's a snowshoe hare in the summer. And here's what they look like in the winter. And again, um, because we haven't been getting snow, they've been standing out looking like white plastic bags. There's the snowshoe. This is the snowshoe hare out on Little Tupper Lake. And the only way that I saw it, and I was driving and I stopped the car because something looked strange out of the lake. <laughs> and I could just see the ears sticking up. It was just hanging out in the middle of the lake. And this is the little chipmunk that I photographed just recently um, that has been active all winter long uh, and is obviously not hibernating this year. Lots of changes. So that was a, a run through some of the many things that I'm noticing um, in the Adirondacks. Lots of, um, and, and, and I'll talk about some of those things in relation to these birds that we're gonna be talking about next. Um, so we'll talk a little bit now about the uh, current and future status of the boreal species and that's uh, male blackback with pectoral. So I wanted to start with the bellwether. That's what they've been calling it. <laughs> the Bicknell thrush is sort of the bellwether for climate change. So we'll talk a little bit about this bird because it's in major trouble. As you can see, it has a very restricted breeding range up here, disappearing very quickly from Canada, by the way, and a very restricted wintering range down in the Dominican Republic, Haiti, uh, Puerto Rico, Cuba. Although from some of those islands, it seems to be disappearing completely now. The researcher, um, Chris Rimmer, who, who studies the bird in Vermont and runs the Vermont Center for Eco Studies that does the Mountain Bird Watch project, um, monitoring Bicknell's thrush across four states, also goes to their winter habitat in the winter to study them. And I should play the sound. It's got a beautiful sound. Hopefully you can all hear this and hopefully it's not too loud on your computers. <laughs> it has a beautiful fluty voice. They like to sing, they start singing in the dark. <laughs> they like to sing very early and they sing into the dark at night. Call notes, lots of different call notes. These are just a few of them. They have a growl sound and all kinds of different things that they make. So they, they live, and I used to tell people, look above 3,000 feet. Now I tell people look above 4,000 feet because they're disappearing very quickly from lower elevation areas. So if you want to guarantee, I tell people now to look over 4,000 feet for this bird there. They live on what's considered to be sky islands. Um, they're, their habitat are those, those upper reaches of the mountains. This is a big nail stretch that um, uh, Jeff Nather took, beautiful photo. I took this one and they sing from uh, dead snag perches up on the mountain. It's a ground bird. Bicknell thrush is a ground bird in balsam fir habitat. So they're really impossible to see if it's not out singing or calling or feeding young in July. It's a really tough bird to see. 
Um, and they have adaptations for hopping around in their very dense habitat that you'll see in the zoo. Uh, they're very elusive. Uh, they're, they're up there and the, it's often cloudy, it's often foggy, it's really intense, it's windy. They live in a really difficult realm. We're often up in June, up on white base in winter attire with hats and gloves, <laughs> freezing in the wind. And we come down and it's in the 80s and people look at you like, well, where, <laughs> where did you come from? And I actually have a separate website that gives the high elevation forecast that I want because it's usually very different from down below because you're talking about thousands of feet up. So this is a big nose thrush with food for young that Sue Barth took this photo. Uh, the researcher, uh, Chris Rimmer, was ecstatic when he saw this because you can actually see what it's carrying, the different insects that it was going to feed the young bird. Really great shot. This is a baby big nose thrush that we found. I think this was 2016, I believe in the road, um, just out of the nest, really adorable, very tired, it kept sleeping, it has no tail, very hopeful, it was just nice to see that. And here's an adult, and you can see they have these extra long tarso metatarsus, <laughs> very long name, um, and that's an adaptation for bouncing around in their habitat, in their very thick habitat on the ground. And we actually watched this bird, and there you can see part of its bounce. It bounced um, up against the wall and would come back into the road and bounce up against the wall and come into the road. It was eating insects, but it was, it was bouncing like a bouncing toy. And so this is an adaptation for this bird for where it lives, which is kind of interesting. Um, here's a video. It's actually singing in the dark. The woman I was with who works for National Audubon has really good eyes. She spotted that bird in the dark. And we watched it. It got lighter and I, I got this video. And this bird wasn't on a dish tag, it was in a live tree, and it was first on um, the ball from her home, she sticks straight up. Um, really good home crop that year. And you can see the birds responding to another bird that's falling below. Okay. Winter wren, very loud in the background. <laughs> um, and this was Memorial Day weekend, and we were up on the road, and there was a bird singing um, on a typical dish tag bird. Thrushes get up there and they just hang on and, and just sing away, and it's uh, it's it's pretty harsh. So where is this this habitat for big nose thrush? Um, about 25% of it's in New York. So here you can see the Adirondacks, the Catskills, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine disappeared from from Massachusetts. It used to be on Mount Greylock in Massachusetts, but it's gone from there now. So in New York, we've got uh, nearly a quarter of the U.S. population's um, uh, the big nose thrush. A quarter of the habitat for a big nose thrush in the in the United States. New Hampshire has 45 percent. You can see it's pretty well conserved in three of the states and not so much in Maine. Um, so the habitat's conserved. It's got plenty of habitat but it has lots of other threats. Um, and so they they come up with that um, where the habitat would be based upon knowing some different facts. Like the temperature changes one degree Celsius for every 500 feet in elevation in the Northeast. So there's a temperature lapse rate that they're aware of. Um, and the mountain ecotones occur where the temperature limits the growth of tree species. So the balsam fir tree is a very cold, um, cold. it can deal with real extreme cold, balsam fir trees. And these boundaries correspond well with mean July temperatures. So they've been able to take this information and come up with this, this current map of where they think the habitat is for big nose thrush. And the current, um, this was actually a study that was done almost 20 years ago now. So this is actually old and we're already at this point with a one degree Celsius increase. Now, as a researcher, um, I just saw him give a present, one of the researchers at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies gave a, a talk and said, you know, while we're kind of mapping this out, we don't really know how fast this is gonna happen, but this is showing the disappearance of that balsam fir habitat. But so far the researchers don't know what, because we're, we're increasing the CO2 so quickly um, and, and the temperatures are starting to increase. They don't know how fast the vegetation is going to, to respond. Um, if some of you have read Elizabeth Colbert's um, the, the Sixth Extinction, um, she actually talks about how some of the trees in South America are moving upslope 100 feet a year and others aren't moving at all. 
So there's so much to think about here because you are going to have hardwoods that are going to start moving up the mountain. But what's going to happen to all of that balsam fir? They don't really know. Um, the researcher thinks that maybe at some point they'll stop producing cones um, as they're dying off, but there's going to be some period of time where, where those trees are still there. Um, here's what happens at two degrees Celsius increase, and you can see you're kind of getting down to the Adirondacks and, and, uh, and New Hampshire mountains, the White Mountains. This is a three degree Celsius increase. So you can see this is um, what will happen eventually to the habitat given this kind of a warm up. How fast it'll happen is an unknown. Here's a four degree Celsius increase where there's only a few mountains left that would have appropriate habitat. And by five, it's pretty much, the habitat's pretty much gone. And here's a bar graph showing that. Some of the states that are hit hardest are Maine and Vermont by the, by the increases, uh, more so than New York and New Hampshire. So has warming already had an effect? Um, it has, um, and I've been watching that happen. I've been watching extirpations of big nest thrush on the lower elevation peaks and along the southern edge of the breeding range, um, the disappearance from Mount Greylock also. The patterns consistent with climate related ch range shifts observed in other animals. The average, um, the average temperature is supposed to rise three to five degrees Celsius by 2100 and, and to convert that, that's five to 11 degrees Fahrenheit which is a really incredible um, rise in temperature. And these documented altitudinal rain shifts were docu documented by Jeremy Kirkman of the um, New York State Museum in Albany. He's the ornithologist there. Um, and he got this published in the December 2017 Wilson Journal of Ornithology. And what he did was he replicated Ken Abel's surveys from 40 years ago. And he was able to document that there's twice as many species breeding on the summit of Whiteface than there were 40 years ago. Um, and he's documented the altitudinal range shift of 500 feet for Swainson's thrush, which is a real problem for big nose thrush, since it's a more dominant bird and it's supplanting it, especially on the lower peaks already. Um, and he documented a 1500 foot um, upslope range shift for robins. And I actually watched that play out because the first year that we encountered a robin on the summit of Whiteface, we thought it was some kind of a fluke. And then the next year there were more, and then the next year there were more. So this range shift, they've moved upslope 1,500 feet already. Um, so this is going on across the world, by the way. It's not, this is not just in the Adirondack Mountains. This, uh, this is happening everywhere where there are mountains. You're seeing this upslope shift. The problem is big nail thrush is already at the top. <laughs> and there's no more up. So um, what's going to happen, it doesn't, it doesn't look good for the bird. It definitely doesn't look good. The summer breeding season average daily minimum temperature is up 4.43 degrees Fahrenheit in Lake Placid, and the maximum daily maximum temperature is up 3.38 degrees Fahrenheit in Lake Placid in the past 40 years. And they found that that minimum daily minimum temperature plays a big role in, in birds moving upslope. Um, the reason that Swainson's thrushes have been able to move upslope on the mountains is because the springs are warmer, and the Swainson's thrushes couldn't, uh, when the temperatures were too cold, couldn't, couldn't live in very cold temperature. So they've been able to shift up slope now. Other climate related factors, natural disturbances like I was showing you those extreme events, weather events that we've been having, uh, prey abundance. Um, obviously the, the insect populations are, are plummeting. Um, the breeding and migratory phenology, the timing um, is, is a problem for some birds. Some birds come back, big nose thrush comes back on a schedule. And so what happens is if the food that they're eating, you know, hatches early, that's a problem. So the, the timing can be a little bit mixed up. So, uh, the waterfowl seem to be responding and they come back earlier. But a lot of the birds that come you know, from Central America and South America come back on a, on a time scale and their, their food might be gone by the time they get back because things are being mismatched at this point. And competition, like the Swainson's thrush. And you see lots of fighting up on, up on white faces, lots of fights between big nose thrush and Swainson's thrushes. Um, and Swainson's thrushes have uh, been documented to have diminished big nose thrush singing, and it's that's a huge change. Big nose thrush used to just, you know, you just hear incredible singing in the morning, and now it's very, um, it's very brief, and it's much less. And the Sphinx and thrushes, when they hear the big nose thrush, will start singing and kind of um, kill the the big nose thrush from singing, just because they're more dominant. And we also have the balsam uh, woolly adelgid, which will be a problem, and that will kill off the balsam fir trees, and that would be really devastating to the mountains. And wild cards that we're not even thinking about, um, like those blue jays, and I'll get to that. <laughs> um, 
that's a uh, that's something probably nobody considered but so just all of these little changes add up to big things uh, for some animals um here are the population uh, trends in mountain bird watch 2.0 mountain bird watch has been going since the year 2000 in 2011 they changed the whole format and so they can't compare that to the, the prior decades numbers um, easily so they're just showing you a decade change here and in new york state there's strong evidence for a negative trend with minus three um, 0.76 percent drop per year. Catskills even steeper, and in the Adirondacks, which is a likely negative trend, we've got a 2.83 percent decline. So big nails thrush was um, only recently recognized. It only became a species in 1995. It was originally found in 1881 by Eugene Bicknell. Um, who discovered big nails thrush on Slide Mountain in the Catskills, and he sent uh, a, a bird to Robert Ridgway at the Smithsonian, who looked at it and thought it looked like a gray cheek thrush, so he made it a subspecies, even though they have totally different um, ranges, breeding ranges, and they're different species. So George Wallace did some more um, uh, studying of the bird in 1939, and Henri Louette, Louette conducted a careful taxonomic assessment in 1993, which led to its recognition as being a separate species in 1995. And only 15 years later, the Center for Biological Diversity petitioned the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to put Big Nails Thrush to listed under the Endangered Species Act. And in 2017, it was turned down. And what's happening is any animal that um, the main threat is climate change is being turned down, um, like the American pika out west. Um, because once you list something, you actually have to prove that you're doing something about the threat. And the government doesn't want to be in a position to have to do something about climate change. So, they're just kind of turning these down at this point because there's really nothing that they think they can do about it. So, um, so anyway, big nails thrush is kind of disappearing and it's not being listed. Um, anyway, lots of things to talk about with big nails thrush. And I also wanted to mention, I should mention this while I was talking about it, that it has a very unique um, mating system called polygynandry. So females mate with multiple males and males mate with multiple females. Anyway, it's totally mixed up. And males feed young in multiple nests. So males will feed young in five different nests, even nests where they don't have any young. So it's a very mixed up mating system um, that happens when you have very limited real estate. Um, so so they, they're kind of colonial. Um, and you'll see that in the singing. So one will start singing and they'll all start singing in a group. And the one will call and they'll all start calling. So. They're a bit, a bit colonial. Um, they, they kind of they nest in these, these group areas. So a really interesting bird. So we'll switch over to the spruce grouse and I'll just talk about now a few of the other species. Spruce grouse is, is, has been disappearing and so the DEC has been bringing in hundreds of birds from Canada and Maine. Um, I opposed that plan. <laughs> I'm not sure if people did. I haven't seen any I haven't seen any increase in spruce grouse. I only see a spruce grouse maybe every two or three years. Um, they're, they're really kind of disappearing. And I think that a lot of the birds that are being brought in maybe are just getting eaten. I don't know <laughs> what's happening to them because I'm just not seeing any more. Um, for you. And you can see, once again, you're gonna see a lot of them. So there's just a little circle over the Adirondack. So this population is very, again, disjoint from the The northern population, by the way, is really fine. So we're losing our spruce grouse at the very southern edge. Um, we're losing it for a lot of different reasons. <laughs> oh, <that one. laughs> um, we're losing it for a lot of different reasons. Uh, logging, um, you know, lots of changes to this fragmentation for this bird's habitat and corridors to move around. It's a resident bird. It needs these corridors. The, the rivers have been dammed. Um, hunters used to shoot them. There was, a, there was an old timer, he's in a nursing home now, and he told me that th these birds used to fill trees in Long Lake and the hunters would just go up and shoot them because they're very tame. And so they would get shot a lot and, and roadways and development kind of totally fragmented their habitat. And you can see remnants of their habitat near roadways. And so you can see that all their corridors from moving around have been kind of disrupted. So this bird has a lot of challenges and I'm not sure that bringing in more is really gonna keep them uh, long term. Here's another picture of a male. And here is a female that uh, which we took, the, I took this picture at, uh, along the Madawaska Trail. It was with a big group of people from Buffalo, uh, 21 people, there's 22 of us. And these birds didn't even look our way. <laughs> this female was, was too young. This is a radio tagged bird. So this is a bird that was probably brought in. 
there's one of the chicks. There are two chicks there in the trees. They're very, very tame birds, very tame, even with a big crowd of people. Um, so I think I would say don't look too good for the spruce grouse. I, I, I know people would like it to be better, but I just, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure the habitat really exists for them anymore. Um, the common loon, again, take a look at the, the range map and you can see that common loon is at the very, you know, in the Adirondacks at the very southern edge of its range. Lots of the birds in Canada will winter either in the Pacific or the Great Lakes. Our loons um, in the Adirondacks have been documented to go east to the ocean. Uh, beautiful, beautiful sound. Right now, the common loon is doing very well, but there's lots of changes underway. Hard to compete with that, so loud one. <laughs> Beautiful sound. Um, so the lakes are having algae blooms. Um, we have lots of invasive species uh, affecting the lakes in the Adirondacks. They're warming. Um, lots of changes underway and the fish populations are changing. And over time, I think this is going to be a threat to the common loon. And the common loon, you know, has been doing very well actually fighting, fighting over territory. They don't have, seem to have enough territory now for the amount of birds, which is a good thing. But I think long term with some of these threats to the, the water, um, it, it's going to be a major issue for this bird. This is um, a Jeff Nadler photo. Uh, this is a Larry Master photo. So I, I have some of my photographer friends' photos in here too. And the babies, when they're real little, are underneath the wing, which is really interesting. So sometimes if you see a loon that looks like it's got a bump, it's actually a baby under a wing. And it's often the, the, the males, by the way, that carry, carry the young on the back. Um, this photo is, um, was taken by Murray Head, who's, uh, who takes photographs for children's books in New York City. And we spent two tremendous days on Middle Pond um, together in my guide boat while he was photographing this, this loon with uh, this family. It was a one, one chick family. And here he got a photo of uh, the adult catching a fish. And here uh, the adult was giving a tiny little fish to the, the chick. And these loons are very, um, very uh, used to people on that particular lake. It's a very small lake. You can actually even see these loons from, from the shore. And when you're out in a boat, they tend not to, to worry so much. And we were very, very considerate and we kept our distance and they would dive for fish and leave us with the chicks. So very, um, very uh, used to people on that, that particular pond. And here's the baby with the fish. Beautiful, he's got some beautiful photos. The second morning we were there, it was real misty and it was just, just beautiful. This is a Larry Master photo. Moons are gorgeous in their green plumage. And we get to see them now outside their breeding plumage because they stay into December. <laughs> they lose their breeding plumage and they used to be gone by then because there was no, you know, no open water, but now we have open water into December. So we have moons into December now. And this was a Larry picture of a nest. Um, I took this one. This was a nest on the edge of Deer Pond in the Massawipi area, right at the edge of the road. And the babies made it. Um, I thought it was a terrible place to pick, but um, I mean, literally this nest was next to the road and the babies were just fine and they grew up and made it. Um, this is a, a video that I wanted to show. This is a loop that I came upon in April on Little Pepper Lake with a fish that was over a foot long. And I stopped the car because I said, no way is that loop going to eat that fish. And you're only seeing the last minute or so here. This, this, this loop bought this fish for probably 10 or 15 minutes, mostly under the water. They have to get the fish head first. They have um, Hello. 
had no idea a loon could eat a fish that size until I actually saw that. It was quite remarkable. I know that sometimes great blue herons will eat fish that are too big and actually choke to death. Um, I haven't seen a loon do that, but I, I was really, really concerned watching that loon eat that fish. Here's a loon with a, has a baby under its wing and it, it, it's swimming around and all of a sudden sees a fish that's interested in under the water, but it can't dive with the baby under the wing. So it's got to dump the baby. So it kicks the baby out from under the wing and the baby kind of bobs around like a little cork. And the babies are vulnerable. When that loon dies, the baby is vulnerable to a bald eagle, um, snapping turtles. There's all kinds of things that predate loon chicks. Um, they get really, loons get really upset when there's a bald eagle perched by, by the pond and, and the loon wouldn't die if, 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 the, uh, if the bald eagle was at the edge of the pond. Here is a loon on a very, very hot day. This is a nest that is used, um, this, this particular spot is used every year. Oops, fix that, there we go. Um, and it was really sad because this is a cold, um, and I was talking about the, the lakes warming up. Um, loons really like cold water. They're really geared for diving there. They're fine with cold. And here's a loon sitting, and it was like 85 to 90 degrees that day. And here's this poor dark bird sitting on a nest for hours on end. And you can see it struggling um, with its mouth open. That particular year, the Canada Jays also flew with their mouths open. Um, we actually watched a couple of northern goshawk babies sitting up in a nest looking like they were baking. Um, there's been some really horrible heat waves and just things that, uh, behavior that I've never seen. I've never seen, you know, Canada Jays flying around with their mouths open. I mean, it was that bad. And this is again, um, Middle Pond, and this was another year, and I just, I was just at the edge of the water and I zoomed in on this because it was really cute. The, the adult, and it could be the, the male, I don't know, was sleeping and this little chick was trying, struggling really hard to get on the back while the adult was down the street. And it looks like they're really adorable. They're those little feet. They look like little um, little canoe paddles, the, the feet of the, of the chick. So the loons are, um, just to kind of summarize, the loons are hanging in there and doing pretty well right now. But long term, I, I, I'm worried based on the changes that are happening to the lakes. And they're happening pretty quickly from what I understand. The blackback woodpecker, and this is a, a male. Let me slide this down for you. Again, if you take a look, you can see that little circle over the Adirondack, southern edge of the range. This is the call note of the, the blackback woodpecker. And then you'll hear the rattle call. And they do that, um, they do that for a lot of different things. They do it when they're mating. I've actually watched them mate for hours and they do the rattle call when they mate. Sometimes if they get really upset, they'll rattle call. This is a female and they're, they're struggling. Um, they're, most of the nests that I've seen in the past five years have only raised one chicken. You're lucky if the nest makes it at all because the red squirrels predate them um, a lot. Um, but if they do make it, I've only been seeing one bird. Uh, last year, there were a few nests with two uh, babies. So uh, something's definitely going on. And then uh, uh, two or three years ago, I was with a New York City Audubon group and we watched a female fly in with food for the young male that was screaming nonstop for food. And she kind of thought about it for a bit on the tree next to the nest tree. And then she ate the food and flew away. And I had never seen, I've never seen that before. Uh, I've never seen a, a female woodpecker with food in its mouth and a baby screaming um, and then just eat the food and fly away. So that was sort of a, a, an alarming sign too, that there's some issues going on. Here's a male in a nest hole and you can see how the bark's been stripped away. And I see this about 50% of the nests 50% of the time they strip the bark for whatever reason and then 50% as you can see in this one they don't. So um, I'm not sure why, why they strip that on some trees and not on others. And here's a male and the male is the workhorse and I'll just say that I'm so, I have such admiration for the blackback male woodpecker because he does all of the excavation of the nest hole and it takes forever. Um, and the female just comes and checks like she'll look in and, and then he'll go back to work. <laughs> and she just kind of inspects it but he does the work. He does all the nighttime incubation on the eggs. He does most of the daytime incubation. He does most of the feeding. They've documented that he takes fecal sacs away on 51% of his feeding visits and the female only 3%, so he's doing the diaper duty. This is a little female that had just fledged out of the hole that was only three feet above the ground, by the way. Um, and here's the male. He fed her for two hours. I never saw the female. 
So I'm going to jump ahead to outside of flycatcher, which is another bird that is declining. Not, it doesn't appear to be steeply declining right now. Um, the numbers are all showing that it's in decline, but it's um, it's sort of hanging in there, and you can still find it um, in many places in the Adirondacks. Great vocalization. It took three beers, and then it's got the um, the pit 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 call note. And you can see that it, it winters in South America, which they think might also be having some of the, the, the reason for its decline as winter, winter habitat. Here's another image of an outsided flycatcher at Masawiki. And this is their habitat. They love these beaver-created wetlands, which is also the habitat for rusty, um, rusty blackbird. And so this is, they inhabit the same area. We actually saw, um, we found a, a rusty blackbird nest at, on the Van der Rocker Trail and actually saw all of sided flycatchers and rusty blackbirds fighting, which seemed odd because they eat totally different things. So, um, but this is what the habitat looks like. yellow belly flycatcher has um, been documented to be declining slightly, um, but it's still kind of hanging in there. And uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society did um, several years of, of boreal bird surveys and found that the, um, the uh, yellow belly flycatcher is doing okay. Didn't find a ton of declines for this bird. This is a high elevation boreal bird, so you find this up on White Face Mountain and in lower elevation uh, habitat also. It's the Chilik sound. It too likes dead snags when it's singing. This is the call note, longer call note than its song, which is unusual. And you can see the Mountain Bird Watch data for this bird um, is declining, not steeply, but it's declining for the past decade per year. Uh, the Canada Jay, again, you've got that little circle of boreal habitat, great sounds, wonderful, very smart bird. And it makes um, all kinds of sounds. sounds like, it can sound like a woman being stabbed, it can sound like a blue jay. So this bird is declining. I'm gonna move ahead here and just show you some of the photos as we go through. Here's a woman who looked like she just came from church at Bloomingdale Bar. <laughs> we were doing a CBC and we gave her some raisins and she was thrilled to hold a Canada J. They're very engaging with people. Um, they are declining. They found a 50% decline in Algonquin Park over the past 40 years, which they've attributed to hoard rot. So these warm-ups are actually ruining the stashes that the Canada Jays make to enable them to get through the winter. Um, I'm also finding that blue jays are, I think, a bigger problem in the Adirondacks because the blue jays are now overwintering and they follow every Canada jay in flocks and they circle them. And so a Canada jay will be stashing food and you'll find a flock of blue jays around the tree that the Canada jay stash in food and they simply take the stash. And so this is happening nonstop and, and it's smart on the blue jays part because they, they're surviving. And they, you know, it's warmer and they've been able to stay through the winter and they decided that, hey, we can just follow these birds and take their food. Um, so it's smart on their part. Here's an adult. Here's a juvenile. A juvenile. This is a nest that was found along this uh, Sagamore Road by John Skilton, who some of you may know, who's, uh, who lives downstate. He found this, and then Larry Master and I watched it, and they raised, uh, this is back in 2012, and they raised four young. You very rarely see um, a Canada Jay with four young anymore, if at all, if any babies. Uh, lots of the birds that I feed don't even seem to have young. And, and here's a nest, that same nest is for you. And this is a video that Larry took. And here is the female of the nest. And the male comes in with food. She pulls some of the food out of his mouth to help feed the young. And this is a behavior that's been, um, this might be the first video of that particular behavior. And then they take away the fecal sacs. But I'm going to move ahead because of the time. This is the female on top of those four young, and they hear the male coming with food, and they, they, they shove her off the nest as the male comes in with food. They're really adorable. And they get to be full size in there. It was pretty funny when they were full size. They were pretty aggressive. So that's a bird that's in decline, um, and I, I certainly am seeing that in the Adirondacks. 
um, in terms of the amount, the amount of babies. It used to be that you'd see three or four babies with a, with a Canada jay. They nest in the winter. They start nesting actually right now at the end of February. And you, the young uh, fledge in April and you start to see them in May. And you know now if I see any at all, usually it's just one. Um, so a huge change. Oriel chickadee is declining in patchy, patchy habitat. They are hanging in there in, in, in extensive habitat. So that's where I go to look for them is extensive habitat because the little patches like Savannah Spog or on the North Coast Trail, you know, you might get lucky and find one, but rarely now, where they used to be regular. So they're disappearing from patches of habitat for whatever reason. And there's a boreal chickadee um, feeding on a deer carcass. This was somebody who put real suet at, at Bloomingdale Bog where they feed the Canada jays and a boreal chickadee came in one year. Really cute, very adorable bird. And this one uh, came in for bread one year when the food sources were low uh, that I was giving a Canada jay. And it did it four times. <laughs> Four different, four different visits, um, and it was just right next to me, uh, waiting for me to put bread down. It was eating bread, it was really strange. The palm warbler is a success story. So, um, almost done here. I just have a couple of words left. The palm warbler is still doing well, and seems to actually have been increasing over the past couple of decades. Sounds like a rattlesnake. Um, and you can see on the, on the range map, see Florida, you can, if you go to Florida, you can see them in winter. Um, so they don't go very far. They're the first warbler species to return um, in, in the Adirondacks in early April. They come back even when there's snow on the ground. Pretty hardy bird. There's a photo um, from Sabathis Bog, and here's one uh, from Spring Pond Bog area. The black pole warbler is declining. Um, this is the champion migrant, even though the Alaska birds and the birds from Northwestern North America all shift east in the fall and they launch off and fly over the ocean for four days straight. Um, I don't know if that could be playing a role in their decline, um, you know, with all of the wild weather that we have. Um, but this bird is, is definitely declining. The numbers aren't good. And it's across the whole range, it's declining. Sounds like an insect for those of you who move ahead. And here's the decline numbers. So you can see these population trends and they're all in red because these are pretty serious steep declines that are happening. Uh, you look over 2,400 feet for this bird, so it's considered more of a high elevation bird. So when I tell people we're going up on white base, big nails thrush and black pole warbler are the two birds that you'll see up there that you usually won't see down lower. Those are the, the only two birds. Everything else is down lower too. There's another black pole warbler. You all hearing that? That's the summit of white base mountain. Everybody hears what's singing in the background? <laughs> yeah, we can hear that. That's a robin. <laughs> yeah, we have high elevation robins now. Yeah. And the Lincoln Sparrow um, was found to be doing okay during the Wildlife Conservation Society um, years of study, which are, I guess, almost a decade ago now. But now they seem to be declining, and I know that the Atlas coordinator is a little worried about this bird. Um, I'm definitely seeing a decline in the numbers for Lincoln Sparrow. And that's a bird that you look for in bogs, just like the palm warbler. Palm warbler and Lincoln sparrow you look for in, in the bog area. Beautiful voice, my favorite sparrow song. Um, and unfortunately, it's declining. I'll move ahead, that's a baby Lincoln sparrow. Rusty blackbird, as you probably all know, is um, in a major decline, 98% drop in population, and they still don't know why. Um, they, they nest in beaver created wetlands and the wetlands are changing. Um, you know, they're not as wet. Um, I don't know if that's playing a role. Lots of things predate rusty blackbird nests. Um, the researchers have been studying this bird for two decades trying to figure out what's going on. You know, we used to see hundreds of them in migration and now, you know, you see five, ten maybe. Um, really pretty, pretty sad. And unfortunately, nobody seems to be talking much about this bird. I don't know. Every, everyone's focused on the loon and, and, you know, making sure the loon's okay and the, um, and the spruce grouse, but you know, maybe because it's a blackbird, I don't know, but I love rusty blackbirds and they're really, really hard to find them. And I did find two families, um, groups for the atlas um, in two areas, and but boy, it's tough. It's tough to find this bird anymore. Female, um, here's a male. This male tried to nest um, along Sabatis Road at the inlet of Little Tupper Lake and the nest didn't make it. Um, there's lots of weasels there. I don't know what predated. It was nesting in alders, not, not conifers. If, if the conifers are too far from their mucky areas, they'll nest in, in alder vegetation and this bird's nest didn't make it. 
And that got to the end of that. Um, it's, a, it's a full hour presentation, so I think that's about where, how long I went here. And we have a new generation um, to help us address time to try to end on a positive note. This is the Young Birders Club. Um, I think Anne was talking about the young, oh, she was talking about um, the Warbler presentation for the Young Birders. They're a great group. Uh, these, these kids came up and I've, I've led several trips for them and it's always a great experience. You don't have to tell them or try to convince them about climate change, they just accept it. And, and they're, they're working on it, they're thinking about it. Um, and it's just, it's absolutely wonderful to be around the kids because they definitely don't need to be convinced that we have issues. They, they seem to be well aware of it, which is a nice thing. Um, anyway, so they, it was, that's, that's a group I had up on Whiteface um, telling them all about big nails and the travails of uh, that poor bird because I don't think it's gonna, I don't know. I'm, I'm afraid that the bird could disappear in my lifetime. I think it's gonna go away that fast. So anyway, it was nice to be around the kids and to hear what they think about things. So that's it. And if anyone has questions, 